Section number 22 of The Thrill Book, Volume 1, Number 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Thrill Book, Volume 1, Number 4. Around the World. Episode of Death, Not a Painful One, by Sir Oliver Lodge. I am absolutely satisfied existence is not limited to this present life on earth. Death now seems to me something rather to look forward to than to dread. Clearly it is an interesting adventure, and usually I don't really think that the episode itself is a painful one. Recovery from an accident or from unconsciousness, the coming to, may be painful, but the passing away usually is not. I don't like the word spiritualism myself, except as a term in philosophy. Insofar as spiritualists constitute a sect and hold religious services, I don't belong to it and have no sort of connection with it. On its scientific side, spiritualism is commonly known as psychical research. The research began as an inquiry into unrecognized or partially recognized human faculty and still continues on those lines. But incidentally, the discovery of telepathy rendered probable the deduction that the body and the mind were not inseparable, and hence that one might survive the other. And further experience has led some of us to regard the fact of survival also as now, at length, scientifically demonstrated. I doubt if ever the proof will be so clinching as to overpower the hostility of those determined to think otherwise. I don't pretend it is an easy matter to conceive of the personality and the memory surviving the destruction of the brain. All I claim is that, if they are, as a matter of fact, found to be so surviving, it will amount to a demonstration that the brain is only an instrument or organ, made use of by something not material at all, something which exists in the psychical, not the physical region, something which was only developed or trained in association with matter. I will try to give an idea of what is called the popular proofs of survival. A fairly large number of bereaved people go anonymously, by arrangement made for them, to some reputable and trustworthy medium. No normal information is desired by such mediums, and none is given. They prefer to be in complete ignorance regarding their clients. Sometimes such a bereaved person is accompanied by an experienced note-taker, who records all that is said throughout. In many cases, I should say in the majority of cases dealt with by aid of a strong medium and good form, the evidence for the identity of a deceased communicator, who is represented as anxious to get in touch and to send messages, messages of affection and messages of identification, is felt to be strong, and occasionally it has been overwhelming. The risk of possible mind-reading can hardly be settled in one case or a few cases. Its discussion involves a good deal of experience. The body of evidence which has now accumulated is very great, and the hypothesis of mind-reading from the sitter has to be stretched to near breaking point in order to counteract the dramatic semblance of the whole and reduce it, not indeed to normality, but to something less important than actual conversation with the intelligence and personality of the departed. Inasmuch as a large number of men have only recently been facing death for our sake, it is perhaps only fair that the fact, as I consider it, that death is but an episode in continued existence, and that the interest and enjoyment of life after death exceed what has been experienced here, should be made more widely known, and on that ground I may be excused for giving a rough summary of the popular evidence. Take, for instance, a young fellow killed in the war— and suppose his parents succeed in getting into touch with him. He will greet them in his accustomed manner, calling them by the name they are used to from him, in some cases Pater, in others Dad, sometimes by an unusual nickname such as Herb, sometimes simply Father. Whatever had been customary, that is employed in the most natural manner by the dead son.' 
He may ask after his brothers and sisters by name, or at least by initial, for names are sometimes troublesome things to get through. He may give characteristic touches or comments about each, sometimes thereby showing that he knows in a general way what they are doing. His own appearance can be described by the medium, and little trivial peculiarities or blemishes are often noted, such as scars or marks of an identifying character. As to incidents, I remember one case where a young deceased communicator said to his parents that he had made an appointment to meet his brother in France at a certain bridge, but that when they got to the rendezvous, the bridge was no longer there. It had been blown up. A subsequent letter from the surviving brother in France completely confirmed this statement. The parents had known nothing about these facts at the time of the sitting. Here is another case. Three brothers were all killed. The medium gave the names of all three to mother and sister, who were present, and one of them, the youngest, was represented as the spokesman, ultimately sending a message to his father. Tell him that I have not been talking all the time. The verbal exuberance of this particular member of the family had often been humorously suppressed by the father. In another instance, a boy spoke of something in a waistcoat pocket which he wanted given to his young brother. His clothes had been folded and put away, but on examination a coin was found in the place described. A frequent test given is a description of the old house where the family had lived, small details and peculiarities being emphasized, arrangements of furniture, pattern on wall, and sometimes even the books in a bookcase being remembered. Another incident concerns two boyfriends who died of illness within ten days of each other, but separated by a considerable distance. The death of the first boy, named Herbert, was kept from the knowledge of the second. Yet, when he too died, his friends reported that he smiled and said, Why, Herbert, I am glad to see you. Some good incidents were published by Mr. Wilkinson in the London Magazine for October 1917. They are rather typical instances of the kind of thing that occurs. The name Podger, for instance, and reference to a bronze thing like a coin in his satchel. A similar case is related by Sir William Barrett in his book On the Threshold of the Unseen. A young officer who had been killed said he wanted a pearl tie pin, which would be found in his kit, sent to a lady whom he named at a certain address, saying that he had been secretly engaged to her. Nothing of all this was known by the family, but the communication was so clear that they wrote a letter of inquiry to the address given. The letter came back marked unknown, and the whole thing was thought to be imaginary or a meaningless fabrication. When his kit came back, however, a pearl tie pin was found in it, and when later, on his will, was discovered the young lady's name, just as it had been given at the sitting, was mentioned as his residuary legatee, and his engagement to her was admitted. Everything was correct, therefore, except the address. Why the address was wrong, I don't know. The fact that it was wrong, perhaps, allowed the other portions of the communication to be verified in a more gradual manner. But usually in cases of this kind, there is some little part of the communication which is wrong, and it is most charitable to attribute the error to difficulties in communication or to unsuspected lapse of the medium into normality, like a sort of momentary waking up in the middle of a dream and then continuing it again after an interval of imaginative inventiveness not justified by anything in the main dream, nor by any Anything for which the main communicator was responsible. Indeed, he might not know that it had been interpolated. Some striking examples of messages, at first thought wrong or meaningless, but subsequently found justified by rather laborious inquiry among comparative strangers, are given in the books of J. Arthur Hill, Psychical Investigations, and Man is a Spirit. I have come across singular cases of this kind myself. In such cases, telepathy from the sitter as an explanation is absurdly impossible. The survival hypothesis, in practice, works. All others require straining and supplementing and using alternatively on different occasions. If people have a reasonable knowledge of what to expect when they find themselves suddenly transferred to other conditions, the transition is hardly even a shock. It is surely desirable that people who face great dangers should be prepared for what may happen to them, and take it as part of life's experiences. It is certainly wrong and desperately misguided to seek that experience prematurely, but sooner or later it is bound to come, and if it come in the course of duty and in a struggle for a noble cause, they may be happier to whom it thus comes than we who will encounter it in a more prosaic way. They may be happy in the opportunity. Their readiness is all.
When you think they're dead in Mexico, they're not. To the average reader, or to the less than average thinker, Mexico is known primarily as the land of revolution. To many, it is known merely as a southerly nuisance, which has long meant ill and done no good for itself or for the world. Yet Mexico, aside from its importance as one of the greatest potential treasure lands of the earth, is the nation of a thousand strange incidents, a stellar one of which is the strange phenomenon which develops through a combination of primitive burial methods and deep-lying superstition. Now, Mexico has produced a new miracle. It was related some time ago in the columns of La Prensa, the Spanish-language daily newspaper of New York City. Under the caption, A Case of Resurrection, La Prensa says, In Culiacán, Republic of Mexico, a strange incident occurred a few days ago. A man named José Martínez died suddenly. After the physicians had declared that he was quite dead, the family, with all the pomp customary in the place, prepared to make the interment. Friends and relatives kept vigil beside the body during the night, and on the following day at ten o'clock in the morning, the cortege began its march to the cemetery. When the journey was half finished, the mourners noticed that the coffin moved. A few moments later, the supposed dead man, giving unquestioned evidences of life, opened the cover of the coffin by means of powerful blows, sat up, discarded the shroud, and returned running to his house. The disposition of most Americans, as skeptical as most Mexicans are credulous, will be to poo-poo such a miraculous tale. But it must be remembered that there is no embalming in provincial Mexico, and that the native physicians often are careless and incapable. Here is the tale of a Mexico City beggar, which was told in the newspapers of the Mexican capital some 15 or 20 years ago, and has some sound supporting testimony. A beggar, one of the horde of prosperous mendicants that infest the capital, died, or supposedly died, of a disease the sanitary department authorities did not take the trouble to determine. At the time, paupers were buried in a cemetery far out from the city. This beggar's savings probably were commandeered by the first person to learn of his death. At any rate, he was consigned to a pauper's grave. The Latin American custom, proper, is to have streetcar funerals. A single track runs to the cemetery. The line is never used except for funerals. The coffin is placed in a funeral car, usually decorated like a hearse, and the mourners follow on ordinary streetcars. On Saints' Day, special cars are run out to the cemetery for the convenience of mourners for those already buried. In the case of paupers, it was the custom in Mexico City to consign the body to a plain box and place it on a flat car, such as is used for hauling ballast for the railway. The flat car was drawn by a mule, in the sole charge of a peon employed by the cemetery corporation. In the case of the Mexico City beggar who died penniless, strange fate for a Mexico City beggar, such was the funeral. It was an autumn day with a warm sun, and the mule jogged along, wagging his ears contentedly. The peon sat on the edge of the flat car, swinging his legs and humming a verse or two of Valentina, a peon love song. The end of each verse ends with a sentiment which might be translated thus. If they are going to kill me tomorrow, why does it matter? I must die sometime anyway. Despite the words, the song is a happy one, although it is said that because of Valentina's love, evil will follow. The singer stopped swinging his legs. Both of the mule's ears stiffened, with their position sharply to the rear. A voice. The car was sliding quietly over the tracks, far from the city, between fields where no man lived and no bird sang. The driver looked round and saw the body sitting upright in the coffin, holding the cover to one side as if he had just opened a door and was standing on the threshold. The driver stared. The mule stood stock still. "'Hurry, coachman, we shall be late to the ball,' said the dead man. The beggar had always been a funny fellow." The driver promptly swooned. He fell forward between the flat car and the mule's hind legs. The mule looked around and brought his ears sharply to attention. He was a cemetery mule, whose only occupation was hauling paupers' bodies and supplies for the cemetery. Whether he was frightened by the sight of the dead man sitting upright or by the driver's fall behind his legs was never determined. At any rate, he ran away, something a Mexican mule, especially a Mexican cemetery mule, will not do except in the last extremity of fright. The body leaped out of the coffin and grasped the reins. He stopped the runaway after a heroic struggle. Then he walked back and picked up the driver who had been killed by the wheels of the car or the heels of the mule, superinduced by sheer fright.
The dead man carried the driver's body over his shoulder back to the car, where the mule, fatigued by his exertion, stood resting. He deposited his burden in the coffin, seated himself in the driver's place, and said, Let's go, to the mule. At the cemetery, the dead man dug a grave with a shovel brought by the driver, buried the driver's body with due care, said a prayer over the open grave, tumbled in the earth, and drove the mule back to the city and reported to the proper authorities the regrettable accident. The Mexican authorities said that the beggar had been stricken with tropical sleeping sickness, shrugged, and paid no more attention to the matter. He kissed the spirit of his departed sweetheart. Dr. H. A. Cross, a Chicago dentist who claims to have had some weird experiences, declares that the reason more people do not communicate with the departed is because the laws governing their acts are not understood. I have seen spirits, talked to them, touched them, and felt them. I believe the most vivid of all my experiences was a spiritual kiss, said the doctor while discussing the life beyond the grave. It was at a meeting held some time ago in a Park Avenue home. A number of us were assembled in a room which was light enough to make all objects clearly discernible. Quite a number of spirits had appeared, and among those most immediate to me, my mother and father. After a while, there came to me the form of a beautiful young woman I had known years before. She had left this earth at the age which I then saw her, and she spoke to me in whispers, always whispers, but I knew her. She was the first love of my life. She reached her arms toward me, and I approached her. She told me that she must go, but first kissed me. Then I put my arms about her and kissed her, but as I did so, the young woman, who was as completely material as anything could be, melted away into atmosphere. Of course, I have had many other experiences, but I regard this as the most impressive. I would say the touch of a spirit hand is as that of a baby's. It is soft as a rose leaf. It is something. Nothing. Mrs. Cross also spoke of remarkable experiences in the spirit world. She said that some years ago, after the death of an infant son, the child reappeared to her exactly as he had been in health. It is not only in connection with those who have gone before that the spirits have come to me. Some time ago, I was strongly impressed that I should take a trip to New Orleans. I did not want to go. In fact, could not afford it at the time. But when I resisted the impression, I became nervous, and I soon changed my mind and went. I was passing out from under the heavy curtains that divided the dressing room from the rest of the car when I was turned suddenly around. A voice said, "'Stoop down!' I did so, and there on the carpet, at my feet, lay a diamond ring. I have made all possible efforts to find the owner. Live Wire Kills Maid in Bath Mrs. Lena DeLong, a maid in the employ of Hotel St. Francis, 1570 Hayes Street, San Francisco, California, was electrocuted as she was taking her bath one morning recently when a small electric heater which she had placed on the edge of the bathtub fell into the water. The body was discovered shortly before nine o'clock, when Philip Brush, who lives in Mrs. DeLong's flat, returned after his night's work. Brush, upon discovering the bathroom door locked and receiving no response when he knocked, entered by an outside window. He barely escaped electrocution himself, when, in the belief that the woman was still alive, he attempted to lift her body from the tub. Girl Does Not Know Identity Another mystery was added to the long string now in the hands of the Bureau of Missing Persons of the New York Police Department, when a strikingly handsome girl, well-dressed and bearing every evidence of refinement, was found wandering aimlessly in the vicinity of Broadway and 114th Street. She was evidently suffering from amnesia, and while she gave her name as Frida Emerson and her address as Purdy Avenue, White Plains, police of that place have notified the New York Department that there is no family by that name living on Purdy Avenue. She wore a dark blue velvet dress, a black coat with fur collar, black silk stockings and black shoes, and a taupe satin hat. Her eyes are very large and blue, and she has blonde hair and is of light complexion. She is five feet four inches in height and weighs about 115 pounds. The police think she is about 17 years old. A group of six teachers from DeWitt Clinton High School were questioning the girl when she was first seen by patrolman Cameron. 
they had not been able to obtain any information from her so she was taken to the west one hundred and twenty fifth street station where she was questioned by detective sergeant macdonnell to him she said that she had left a girlfriend whom she called pearl travers at the ritz carlton hotel earlier in the afternoon but further than that she could remember nothing she carried a package beneath her arm containing a pair of new brown shoes and a pair of pink silk stockings she said that she had taken off her evening clothes and left them in a dying establishment but could not remember where it was located the girl told detective donnelly that she wanted to write a note to her mother and when she was given pencil and paper she wrote three times the name frida emerson and the words purdy avenue white plains she said that she knew a family by the name of broomberg on west end avenue new york and that at one time she was a private secretary to a well-known lawyer here the girl carried a purse containing a twenty dollar bill and some change she was later taken to knickerbocker hospital the teachers who first discovered her on broadway will look after her until she has been identified mrs wilcox talks to dead ella wheeler wilcox has so long been associated with all that is beautiful in the spirit of poetry that it is interesting to hear of her conversion to spiritualism when she talks of this newly found faith she becomes transformed and her bright eyes fill with mystic light for a whole year after i lost my husband said the widow poetess in a recent interview i searched in the valley of sorrow for this new light before he died he promised me i should have knowledge of him if it were possible god has no secrets he does not intend to share with those who are adventurous enough reverent enough patient enough to seek the way of knowledge the world war has prepared the minds of human beings as nothing ever before prepared it for the study of the worlds beyond a spiritual awakening has begun which will leap over the barrier set by creeds and dogmas seeking its own trail of truth a triumphant note crept into her voice as she continued to explain it was her mission to give the knowledge she has gained to a world never so willing to receive it as now it was the ouija board worked by a friend who had previously no idea she was a medium which made it possible for me to communicate with my husband my friend and i sitting together were suddenly shaken by a power which beggars description it was like an electric shock the board seemed to be a thing alive it moved with such force and speed that at first we could not follow it then we read brave one keep up your courage love is all there is i am with you always i await your arrival at last i knew my message had come for after experiencing the electric shock of its transmission i was in touch with robert he had kept his promise i asked how long i must wait in the body before going to him the answer was time is not hope for bliss with me i am incomplete without you two halves make a whole i attempted to obtain advice about business but was told material things are unimportant i then asked questions regarding my health and the reply came fill yourself with god health will come death does not make souls omnipotent immortal life is a matter of slow growth toward greater power and knowledge doughnut leaps from table when miss angeline sweet who was boarding at the stone hotel in sweeney new york entered the dining room the other morning for breakfast she seated herself at a table as usual and while waiting to be served saw a doughnut on an opposite table leave the plate and fall to the floor her curiosity was aroused she went to the table and was surprised to see the doughnut running around the room she called to the waiter who chased the animated sinker into a corner investigation revealed that a mouse was wedged into the hole of the doughnut and could not extricate itself the mouse was killed but none of the boarders are eating doughnuts just at present vest button stops bullet oscar henderson clerk in an italian fruit and candy store in new york city owes his life to his lowest waistcoat button 
the cloth-covered metal button deflected a bullet fired at such close range that the powder scorched a spot as large around as a saucer on the waistcoat the impact of the bullet left a slight black and blue mark on henderson's body but it could hardly be called an injury a crazed man did the shooting he was arrested end of section twenty two